Well, good morning. So I'm David Rhodes, the lead pastor here at PNC. Uh, it's an exciting day this morning. And the baptism, you know, when you go under the water, it symbolizes being buried with Christ and dead to the old way of life, right? And when you're raised up out of the water, it symbolizes what? Being raised with Christ to live a new life by his power. So, you know, nothing magical in the water, but it's a decision that we're making to allow Christ to do some great work within us. Wow, what a great, uh, what a great weekend. Have you, are you having a good weekend? Uh, if you ask, ask people, how was your weekend? They would probably say, well, I had like, uh, you know, I you know, took a little trip with my family. Or I, maybe this weekend I, I took the kids to an Easter egg hunt. Or we're having family over after church. Stuff like that. Typical conversations about a weekend might go something like that. Well, I had to work. Or, oh, man, it rained all weekend. You know, how that goes. If you can imagine sitting across the table at a coffee shop with Jesus and saying to Jesus, well, how was your, how was your weekend? <laughs> yes. So, like, he's probably going to say, well, you really want to know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, because we always say yeah, when we, even when we're not sure, you know. Yeah, I'd like to know, how was your weekend? Well, he says, uh, on, on, uh, on a Thursday night, uh, one of my closest associates betrayed me. And then uh, also one of my very closest friends, one of the three most intimate friends that I have, uh, whom I named The Rock, he actually denied me. And then uh, before that night was over, I was arrested. On Friday, I was, uh, I was endured three trials and I was severely beaten and then I was crucified on the cross. <laughs> you just go, is this guy kidding me or... Did this really happen, right? But then, let me tell you about Sunday morning. I put my trust in my father, and on Sunday morning, well, that's why we're having coffee today. He raised me from the dead. Yeah, right? Now, what I want to say is, now that, you know, top this weekend, right? <laughs> that was quite a weekend. Well, why'd you do that? I mean, really, you went through all that. Why did you do that? And he would look right across the table at me, or you, if you're sitting across from him, no matter who you are, and he would say, I, I did it out of joy for you. I did this for you. It's amazing. It's what we celebrate today. This resurrected Lord. He's not dead, not in tomb somewhere. He's been raised from the dead, and it, it makes a big difference for us. In fact, I have, a, I have a few questions for you. Uh, have you ever longed for a do-over? No, I'm not talking about redoing your hair, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about a do-over in your life. I've, I, I've talked about this before, but one of the do-overs I wish I had was the three, first three or to nine years of our marriage. <laughs> I would like to have, I'm sorry, Lynette, I would like to have that as a do-over. But the first three years when I was in graduate school and she was out in the workforce and I just absolutely, I mean, I, consume, I was consumed by my studies and by working and all. And we were like, you know, the only day we were together was, uh, was Saturday. And, and that was the only day that, that we uh, argued. <laughs> so much for being together, right? But when I look back, I said, man, I wish I could do that over again. Because I've learned a few things and I would like to, you know, if I could just do it again, right? Wrong. We'd probably end up repeating the same stuff because we tend to get stuck, right? Here, here's another, another question that really pertains. Have you ever believed the lie that you are stuck and there's no way out? Have you ever been depressed because of your failures? Have you ever felt that God is simply not real or that he is not interested in you? Oh, sure, he may be the God who loves the whole world, but for you just to, to personally feel that God is interested in your life for the good, just, it passes you by, right? Ha have you ever been striving hard to make up for your mistakes? Do you ever feel boxed into hurt or disappointment and shame? Are you aware, are you aware of being celebrated or are you only Mostly aware of being a, dis a disappointment to yourself and to others. 
There's just really a lot of people, church or not church, too, are not aware of being celebrated. In fact, we, we sort of end up believing that if we're being celebrated, then somebody's not telling us the truth. But the point is, this amazing God celebrates us and loves us even when we're in the mess that we often find ourselves in. So as a scripture I want to read to you today, I, I, I got to thinking about why did, why, other than I feel like God wants me to talk to you about this particular scripture in the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans. Um, I, I've probably picked like the most difficult, one of the most difficult passages in the, in the New Testament to talk to you about. But I'm, I'm going to simplify it by reading from uh, a, a translation of the Bible, some call a paraphrase, the message translation. So you can just kind of listen with me. If you want to look it up, you can. If you have our Bible app on version, you, uh, you can look that up and uh, find the message and uh, translation and, and listen to this. Because this, like, this is like the great news for the day. You know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. And, and that sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent to that, uh, of that ex- disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely in the manner that Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God. Everyone has experienced this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one, Jesus, who will get us out of it. Yet the rescuing gift is is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God. Just think what God's gift poured through the one man Jesus Christ will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and the generous life-giving gift. The verdict on the one sin was death, a death sentence. But verdict on many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breath taking recovery that life makes, sovereign life, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man Jesus Christ provides. So here it is, in a nutshell, just as one person did it wrong and got us into all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of the trouble. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he gets us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. And one man said yes to God and put many in the right. That is just awesome. I want to talk to you about the, the, you know, the breathtaking recovery that life makes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're in this dilemma. Uh, I, maybe you, you've heard about it called sin and death. Anybody like seeing any sin or evil or death around? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody watch the news? Anybody listen, listen to anybody else's gossip? <laughs> right? Anybody, you know what you feel in your own life? He says, you know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin and then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. No one exempt. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. A huge abyss of separation from God. So death isn't just about like dying, like stopping, you know, ceasing to breathe. It's about that separation. So whenever like there's separation between us and God, which, which this is kind of what we're kind of born into, then it's called death, right? So we're like kind of the, <laughs> we're kind of the walking dead. But, but not exactly like what you're thinking. We need to be made alive to goodness and truth and life. And our situation is really desperate. I have a son who's a paramedic. And I uh, saw him a few weeks ago. And as we were uh, he, we having coffee early in the morning before he went on his 24-hour shift, then I prayed for him and I said, Lord, just help nobody to die today. Because, you know, that's what you, if you're a paramedic, that's what you want. You don't want anybody to die. 
So we prayed, and he went off to work. The next morning, about 24 hours later, we're getting ready to leave town and go by his station and there uh, have, a, have a conversation. So how'd your, how'd your night go? He says, well, uh, man, right in the middle of the night, we got this phone call. Uh, and the situation was this, that there was a, a homeless man who was sleeping in a dumpster, and the garbage truck came and dumped. And then, fortunately, the driver uh, didn't have uh, earphones in, listening to the music and whatever, and heard the screams of the man and stopped everything and, and, and called us. And he managed to escape with only a broken femur. I just want to ask you, what kind of terror was in that man's life at that moment? When we think about it, we can say several things. Well, the man shouldn't have been sleeping in a dumpster. Well, you know, it kind of applies to us like that. Well, you know what? You shouldn't have been there. You, you shouldn't have been there. You shouldn't have been there in Adam. You shouldn't have, you messed up, you sinned. Well, you shouldn't have done that. Well, now that really helps a lot, doesn't it, for somebody to come and say, well, you shouldn't have done that. Thank you for the help. It's what we do when we're messed up. <laughs> it's easy for us to say, well, I'm glad I'm not that man. When the fact is, we are that man. We are that man. We may want to say, I'm not Adam. I'm, I'm not in solidarity with Adam. I'm not lost in this stuff. But actually, yeah, we are. And, and nobody can climb out of the truck by themselves. And the situation is really severe. It's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. It's not necessarily where we want to be. It's exactly, though, where we are. And so here's the great news that God decides to do something about that. He doesn't leave us where we are, but he loves us. He looks at us where we are, and he decides to take our case on himself. In fact, it says in the same chapter earlier on that when we were still messed up, powerless, weak sinners, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, for us. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And here's, here's the good news. God doesn't look at you and say, you wretched sinner. See, don't confuse your talk with God's talk. God says... When he looks at us in the mess, he says, my beloved treasure, I would do anything to rescue you. And so he does. He does the most extravagant thing possible. And it says that at the right time, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. You know, we have, we have a narrative that we don't, uh, we don't often live into this. Uh, we're living out this narrative. We don't usually think of it like this. And that's the narrative of a tragedy and rescue. Kind of like a b biblical message, one filled with possibilities. There are these two figures. There's Adam and there's Christ. There's like the first man who, who in reality and metaphorically gets us into all this problem. And then there's a second man, Jesus Christ, who really gets us out of it when we put our trust in him. The scripture says... From one man's sin, if one man's sin put crowds of people, that's us, at the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think of what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There is no comparison between the death-dealing sin and the generous, life-giving gift. It's kind of like two figures here, right? If I, I, you know, I won't do this, but if I would call Kevin up here and say, Kevin, you stand right here. You're Adam. You said no to God. You sinned. You got us into the mess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right? There's just one man, right? And I called Chuck up here and says, okay, you're the part of Jesus right here. And uh, you're the one man. You did it right. You're the only man who has done it right. I hate to pit friends against one another. They're going to probably use this against each other at a later day. But here's, here's the thing. That, that, is, that is the choice that we have. We often think of our individuality, Right? We don't think of how we're in solidarity with others. We think that if I sin, I'm just sinning, right? If I mess up, it's just me. Hey, what I do with my life is my business. The problem is, is that what you do with your life spills over onto other people. And it's even bigger than that. We, we were all born into Adam. We all are, uh, you know, are born into that, that separation from God. And we've been all desperately trying to make up for it, get out of it, reverse it, doing, you know, or just going with the flow of it. But the thing is, we cannot save ourselves. So God provides another man, and that other man is Jesus. And what Jesus does is that he submerges himself in our humanity. He enters into our mess. I know it's hard for us to, like, grasp this, but you know that weekend that Jesus had? 
what he took on that we're celebrating over these past few days. He, the, the, the way God's word talks about it is this, that all of the sin and hurt and separation and death that we are a part of, all of it was concentrated for all time on this one person, Jesus Christ, God's gift, so that we can be set free from this man's world to this man's life. Praise be to God, man. And it's in this that life makes a stunning, breathtaking recovery. This, this recovery of life, just like, and it's no, it's no fantasy. It, it all doesn't happen like, like instantly, but something deep inside starts taking place. Um, you ever seen a, a, a breathtaking recovery? Keep in mind this, uh, these numbers, right? 37 months, 14 days. Okay, you got it? 37 months, 14 days. That's not very long ago. It's like three years, right? A month and 14 days. 37 months, 14 days. I was stunned on Good Friday in the morning at a breakfast when I heard the testimony of Elisa Hayes. She, okay, is standing up in front of us speaking 37 months and 14 days after she was struck in her, just her, her, her walking or running body by a 15-ton semi-truck going 65 miles an hour in Kansas, flung 90 feet and impaled on a guardrail with absolutely everything in her body, on her face, completely beyond what you can even imagine. 37 months later in 14 days, she stands up out of her wheelchair with Kane, twirls around, and starts talking to her about God, the reality of God in her life. Now, to me, that's a stunning recovery, right? I mean, she showed us things we didn't want to see. The, the pickup, the big, huge pickup she was driving, uh, and then managed to get out before it had been creamed into, um, well, it had been creamed into twice with her in it. Then she got out to walk and to escape, and then another truck hit her. It was in icy roads, right? It was like un un unbelievable, unbelievable. As, as impressive as that is, and more so, is to see what happens to a person's life who stops following after the old Adam and starts following after the new man, Jesus Christ. You want to see a marriage put back together? You want to, you want to see healing from past wounds? Because a lot of our wounds we don't carry on the outside, do we? Do you want to see forgiveness flow into your life and from your life to others? This, this, is, the, this is the recovery, that, this stunning, breathtaking recovery that life makes when we turn to this man, Jesus Christ. And, for, and forgiveness is like such a, such a powerful part of it. And, and, and be, this reconciliation with God that happens in Christ, and only with Christ. Because you remember, simple gospel, simple gospel is this. You cannot make up for your sins. You can't, you can't make up for them. The only way back is to be forgiven for them. Now, that takes a load off, doesn't it? Are you kidding me? You realize the load you carry when you feel like you have to make up for everything? If I feel like in my marriage, if my wife feels toward me that if she does something wrong, then I'm always looking, like, how are you making this up? How, it's not quite good enough, is it, when you've got to make up something? But when you can be forgiven, oh, what? it's life-giving. I've said a number of times, and I just, I believe this. Please, hang on to this, right? Forgiveness is that act by which the past is robbed of its power to ruin the present and destroy the future. 
Isn't that awesome? So whether it's us hanging on to stuff that other people have done to us, or whether, or whether we're hanging on to the stuff that we have done, forgiveness from God and forgiveness from us to other people robs the past of its power to ruin the present and destroy the future. Forgiveness is a great gift. And we get that. And with that comes all this grace and this life and healing and opportunity and acceptance into God's amazing family. So here it is, right? Here it is. When we lay hold of this gift with both hands. That's, that's the invitation. Can you imagine the, the stunning recovery that, that life makes when we lay hold, grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant gift? So that's what Easter is. That, Easter is a way of saying, yes, we're going to celebrate the man who said yes. We're going to put our lives in with the one who said yes, who got it right. Because I tell you what, I'm never going to get it right like he got it right. But if I learn that if I'm believing in him and trusting into him and letting him begin to shape my life, that I get his righteousness over my life, then that's a good deal. And he begins to shape us and, and make us. This Jesus, by the way, this Jesus has won the weekend. Isn't that cool? He won the weekend. When he was down in that grave, there was a battle going on. Oh my goodness, a battle of epic proportions. And he, in his resurrection, took down the twin towers of sin and death. So that we don't have to be defined by these realities anymore. So the question never is, as we think, should I do good or should I not? Should I be religious or shouldn't I be religious? The question really is not, well, what do I have to give up? No. The question is never about the no. The question is about the yes. When I said yes to Mary Lynette, I found it just ingrained in that yes to stop dating other women. <laughs> now, she didn't have to sit down to me and say, now, are you going to stop dating other women now? No. When I come home from a trip, and she asks me, have you been faithful? I don't have to say, well, yeah, it's pretty faithful. Pretty much. No, no. It's the yes, see. The yes is so life-giving, so fulfilling, so healing. Draws you into God's purpose rather than struggling all on your own to try to make your life worth living. So grasp with both hands. So this morning, we're going to celebrate that. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are celebrating in baptism people who are saying yes to him. And by the way, once you declare the yes to him, it's like, it's, it's a whole lifelong of yeses. It's a whole lifelong of yeses. Because you find that in this man, Jesus, is a preferred future of hope, grounded in reality, just like the resurrection arises out of the cross, as opposed to this man who leaves us in the dilemma of sin and death. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for all that you are up to. Thank you for the invitation, the offer today for our lives to take on something brand new. God, we're just so, so very grateful to you. And Lord, as, as we listen to the testimonies of those that are going to be baptized, Lord, I pray that we would just uh, rejoice with them. In Jesus' name, amen.